We are in the middle of a series that we are calling the Summer of Love, and when we say that, we need to say it like the Summer of Love, Barry White style. So can we try that? The Summer of Love. That's fantastic. And uh, we're looking at this letter uh, of John. Uh, He wrote three letters, one, two, and three John. He also wrote John's Gospel, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he also wrote, right at the end of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. So he did a lot of writing. And he's writing here to a, uh, a church in Ephesus or a number of churches in Ephesus which were divided. Uh, people were preaching different things and the, the new believers in those churches weren't sure what they believed. And so John speaks to them and he primarily speaks to them about love. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, but let me pray for us uh, as we kick off. Father, you're a God who loves to speak. You're a God who reveals himself to us through scripture, by your spirit. And we pray for a breakthrough tonight, fresh revelation that opens up our hearts, where I see something for the first time that we've never seen before, where life uh, bursts out as we encounter you, as you speak to us. So Holy Spirit, come we pray. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear tonight what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Are we ready? Okay, good. Um, John here is talking about love, and I think you'll probably agree. Most of us in the 21st century still think love matters. Is that fair to say? I think it's also fair to say that, in fact, our culture is obsessed by love. And there is good reason for that. It's because love is what makes us human. Uh, A few hundred years ago, uh, René Descartes, a philosopher, uh, began to think, what is it? What is the essence of what it means to be human? How do I understand who I am? And he came up with this phrase, I think, therefore I am. He described human beings as thinking things, if you like, kind of brains on legs. The mind, the, the, our rationality, that's what sets us apart from the rest of the animal world. Well, I think there's lots of truth in that, but it's only half the story. Rewind a thousand years before Descartes, and probably the most intelligent man in Europe uh, at that time, quite possibly the most intelligent man that Europe has ever seen, St. Augustine, he said, not I think, therefore I am, he said, I love and am loved, therefore I am. He said, we're not thinking things, we are affective animals. Our, Our affections, our desires, our loves define who we are as human beings. And so every human being uh, wants love, needs love. It is love that makes us who we are. The question is, of course, what is love? And it's that that I think um, confuses our culture. That's where the questions come from. That's where so much of the debate goes on. We have a contested understanding of what love is. Is it intimacy and romance? Is it kind of inclusion and tolerance? Is it an emotion or a feeling or something we do? What is love? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary, of course, the greatest dictionary in the world, um, defines love uh, for us, and as you listen to this definition, you'll see where some of the problems come from. So it says, love the noun, a strong feeling of affection, a great interest and pleasure in something. The example it gives is football. A person or thing that one loves. A score of zero in tennis or squash. The verb, it defines as, to feel deep affection or sexual love for someone. Really interesting. So quite a wide official definition of love. I personally prefer the the definition you find in Captain Corelli's Mandolin, that great novel. Uh, This is what uh, is said there. When you fall in love, 
It is a temporary madness. It erupts like an earthquake and then it subsides. And when it subsides, you have to make a decision. You have to work out whether your roots are to become so entwined together that it is inconceivable that you should ever part. Because this is what love is. Love is not breathlessness. It is not excitement. It is not the desire to mate every second of the day. It's not lying awake at night imagining that they are kissing every part of your body. No, he says, don't blush. I'm telling you some truths. For that is just being in love, which any of us can convince ourselves we are. Love itself is what is left over when being in love has burnt away. It's pretty good, isn't it? A compelling definition. Uh, as I was researching for this talk, the, uh, I looked at uh, a survey that the Huffington Post, the online newspaper, had uh, put up, and it asked its readers to define love in one word. One word. I wonder, how would you define love? Give me some things. What was your one word? If you wanted to define love, what would it be? Forgiveness. Go on. Caring. Sacrifice, passion, affection, some good ones in here. They came up with things like paradise, intoxicating, fulfillment, butterflies, magic, uh, indescribable, visceral, I like that one, elusive, passion, complete, ideal, devotion, friendship, empathy, unconditional, selfless, compromise, humility, Huge range of concepts and ideas there. My favorite bit of research on our understanding of what love is actually came from a group of four to eight-year-olds that were asked the question, what does love mean to you? This is what they said. Rebecca, aged eight, said this. When my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis. That's love. Carl, aged five, said love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> Danny, aged seven, says love is when my mummy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure it tastes okay. Chris, age seven, says love is when mummy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is handsomer than Robert Redford. <laughs> and my personal favorite, Mark, age six, says love is when mummy sees daddy on the toilet and she doesn't think it's gross. <laughs> so I think you can see love is something we all want. It's something we all need. It what makes us who we are, but we don't know what it is. And here tonight, we have this ancient text's take on love. And we're getting really into the nitty-gritty, into the detail of his letter. And we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at John's call on us to live out love, his challenge to live like Jesus, and then the way that we can do that, which is to live from love. So we're going to start with this idea that we are to live out love. Why do I say that? Well, look at verse 11. Love is the way of Jesus. He says, we've got a message, the message that was right there from the beginning. What is the message? It's the gospel. It is something that we have to pass on, something to remember, something to get right, and it includes in it this something to do. We are to love one another. It's much more than a theory, much more than a story, much more than a set of ideas. It is a way of life to be lived. What does that life look like? Well, he starts negatively, verses 12 and 13. He says, well, it's not the way of the world. Don't be like Cain, he says. Now, Cain, you find in Genesis chapter 4, he was the eldest son of Adam and Eve. He had a younger brother called Abel, and they both offered sacrifices to God. Uh, Abel offered uh, animal sacrifices, and Cain offered some vegetables from the earth. And uh, it's a difficult story uh, for all vegetarians, because God did not accept Cain's sacrifice of vegetables. He much preferred Abel's sacrifice of meat. 
That was a joke, by the way, so just in case you're a vegetarian and you just got offended, I apologize, that was a joke. Um, and, uh, and in response, Cain got angry with Abel and killed him in a field. It was the first murder, the first serious result, in that sense, of uh, Adam and Eve's disobedience in the garden. And uh, John here says that we shouldn't be like Cain, not that we shouldn't murder, although that's obviously true, but that we shouldn't hate our brothers and sisters. And what he's saying is hatred is simply murder on the inside. It echoes Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount where he says anger is murder in our hearts. It's murder on the inside. And so when he's talking here about hatred, He's talking about a wide range of feelings, of emotions. They might be anger and hatred. It might be dislike. It might be jealousy or envy. He says, don't be like that. Instead, he says, love your brothers and sisters. That's how the world works. Don't hate your brothers and sisters. Instead, make sure you are different. Love your brothers and sisters, he says. Why? Because love is proof of life. Love is proof of life. That's what he unpacks in verses 13, 14, and 15. He says love matters. If we have moved from death to life, we will be living lives of love. The Christian life is a life that has moved from death to life. It is a life of love. And of course, that just echoes the New Testament, So Paul, when he lists the fruit of the Holy Spirit, he starts with, what does he start with? Come on. First fruit of the Spirit is love. That's good, well done. And when he talks about faith, hope, and love, he says love is the greatest of these and love will remain. Jesus himself said, by this you will... Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that's why at at this church, when we are talking about um, discipleship, what what does it mean to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus? We say it involves love. It's all about love. It's not about thinking. It's not about doing primarily. It is about loving, loving more, loving God, loving our neighbors, loving ourselves, and loving one another. And lack of love, says John, is proof of death, proof that we live in darkness. So living lives of love really matters. It's proof that we're alive, proof that we're human. And so John says, live out love. But we still have that issue, don't we? What is love? If our definition in our culture is contested. How can we know that we are living out love? Well, thankfully, John here defines love for us. He says, love like Jesus. Look at verse 16. He says, Jesus laid down his life for us. This is love. As Johnson shouted out, it's sacrifice That's what Jesus says when he says, I am not, I'm the good shepherd, he says in John's gospel in chapter 10. I'm not like one of the hired hands looking after the sheep. I'm the good shepherd who will lay down my life for the sheep. It's not an issue of money. I love my sheep and I will die for my sheep. So John is here saying love looks like Jesus. If you want a definition of love, it's Jesus. Love is Jesus. And then he says something extraordinary, something terrifying, if we're honest with ourselves. He says, you lay down your life. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. He says, love like Jesus. Be Jesus to others. Now that is truly terrifying, but actually John makes it pretty simple for us. So it's simpler than it sounds. 
How do we lay down our lives for our brothers? If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. So he's saying something very basic, very simple, but very specific. He says, give your stuff away. That's how you lay down your life for your brothers and sisters. It's, I don't know about you, but I, find that, I don't find that hugely exciting. But it's very clear. Give your stuff away. Do something for someone else else. Don't talk about it. Don't feel it in your heart. Do something. Uh, Joanne and I have been, uh, we've had a tough summer. Joanne's mum uh, died uh, only uh, a month or so ago, and, uh, and you guys have been amazing, looking after us, caring for us. Not by simply saying, tell me if there's anything I can do, or Rod, or so sorry, but practical acts of love that have been a huge help to us. I, this morning, I, I talked about Gordon and Rachel, who when I first came back into a Sunday service, just having come from the family, he just came up to me and he said, Rod, there are three meals in the fridge for you and your family. That's the first thing he said to me. And I have to say, they are fantastic cooks, so it was a huge, huge blessing. Not always the case, but it was in that case. And that's one of the reasons why we, we do talk about giving at St. Paul's. Yes, we want to encourage you to see need uh, and to uh, kind of step in where you can. But the easiest way of doing that, if you like, is just to be regular givers. And John here says it's a sign of life. It's kind of a non-negotiable. You need to give, he says. It's, it's good for the soul. And so really you can't get away from it, but he says, let's see, try it. If you're not giving, try it. Try tithing. It's a good place to start. He talks here of material possessions, worldly goods. He, he brings Jesus' sacrifice right down to earth. It is simple, but it is demanding, isn't it? And you might be sitting there thinking, hang on, no, that's an impossible ideal. That's too demanding. I can't do that. You know, I'm wondering about how I define love, but you're saying love is, is laying down my life. Love is giving it all away. Are you kidding me? Are you joking? That's not what I want to hear. Well, I feel like that too. So you're not alone and the question that comes to me is, well, how on earth can I love like that? Can John really be right? Doesn't it feel impossible? Doesn't it feel ridiculous? Well, John says, no, it's not. So he says, live out love, love like Jesus. And then he says, and this is how you can do it. Live from love. Live from love. And that's verses 19 to 24. He begins that by saying, God is at work through you. However you feel, whether you think, I can't do that, or I am doing that, or I need to do better in my giving, John reassures his readers, and he says, God's love is already at work through you. You're not alone. How do you know that God is already at work through you? Well, look at verse 19. This is how we know that we belong to the truth. Now, in this translation in front of you, it looks like it's what follows that phrase that he's referring to, this is how, but it's actually what's before that phrase. So, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth. If we are giving ourselves, if we are helping others, if we are serving uh, on teams, whatever it might be, if we are doing those things, those are objective evidence of God's love at work in us. They are outward expressions of an, an inner reality. They prove that we are alive, that God is at work in your heart. So if you are giving already, no matter how small, no matter how infrequent, no matter how awkward you feel, you know you're living from love. And the more you love, the more you give, the easier it gets. The more you love, the more you live. 
Now, the astute among you will think, hang on a second, that creates a problem in my heart because it says that I, it, it tempts me to try and give in order to win God's favor. So I can say, hey, I'm giving loads, I'm doing really well. I'm, my material possessions are not my own, I'm sharing them with everybody. I'm good with you, God, aren't I? Or you can be sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, I'm not giving my stuff away. God is not pleased with me. And suddenly you feel fearful and anxious and you lose your assurance. What John here says, uh, describes as our hearts condemn us. Well, John, again, helps us to avoid this pothole because he says not only is God's love at work through you already, he says God's love is already at work for you. Look at verse 20. What do you do when your heart condemns you? You go to God because he is greater than your hearts. And you can have confidence before him. How? Because you've kept his commandments. Now, doesn't that take us back to the same problem that we're just trying to please God with the things that we do? No, because what is his commandment? Look, verse 23, his command is to believe. To trust Jesus. To trust in Jesus' practical act of love for you. Jesus laid down his life for you. He died as a sacrifice to cleanse you from your sin. He died in your place on your behalf for you. That's how he proves his love for you. You see, the cross is much more than simply an example to follow. If I wanted to demonstrate to my wife that I loved her and we were walking along the highway, this huge road out here, and I said, Joanne, I love you. I'm going to show you how much I love you. And I jumped out in front of a vehicle and was killed instantly. Would that demonstrate my love for my wife? Of course it wouldn't. So how is Jesus' death on the cross an example of extraordinary love. Another scenario. If I'm walking down the highway with my wife and, we, uh, and I'm telling her how much I love her and how wonderful she is and how beautiful she is and we're crossing at the crossing and a car ignores it and goes hurtling towards her and I jump in the way, knock her out the way and then I'm killed and I save her, is that an act of love? It is, isn't it? completely different and that is how Jesus demonstrates his love for us on the cross not because he dies an agonizing death but because it is a sacrifice he offers himself in our place he takes on himself God's judgment God's wrath against sin and death and the devil and in doing that he gives us freedom offers us forgiveness and new life. And so we know at long last there's no need to perform because he already loves us. There's no place left for fear. We can know assurance and security and safety in this God who has done everything that needs to be done to make things right between us and him. We can be free to live lives of love. And so he says, live from love, and it's his love for you. His love for you. But he doesn't just leave it. He doesn't say God is already at work through you and his love is already at work for you. He goes on to say God's love is already at work in you. Look at verse 24. His promise is to live himself in us. It says God lives in us and we live in God. That word is an, an old-fashioned word. He abides in us and we abide in him. We rest in him. We remain in him. We dwell in him. We set up our home in him and he sets up his home in us. And so John is saying the spirit is a lived reality in your life. It is the spirit who pours out his love into your hearts so that you can live from love. So just to wrap things up, John says three things in this passage about love. He says, live out love. He says, love really matters. 
It proves you're alive. It proves you're a human being. He says, love like Jesus. Love looks like Jesus. So should you and I. And then he says, and this is how you can, do like, how you can live like that. Live from love. To love right, you must know that you are loved right. You must know that God's love is already at work through you and for you and in you because God is greater than your hearts. 